Thank you, Frank, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. So yes, I still belong to ex Marseille University, but I'm currently in the time zone of New York City. So I got a Fulbright grant to move here for one year um, uh, at Columbia University. So during this talk, I would like to focus on applications of thermoplastonics, nanophotonics, and cell biology. And the common point of all these applications is uh, the imaging of a wavefront, of an optical wavefront. So first, I would like to focus on this uh, concept, optical wavefronts, and then I will uh, describe the applications. So, and especially in the frame of microscopy. So just consider a microscope uh, with an object uh, at the sample plane of your microscope, any object you want, so the object you are used to. And um, so we consider this object and we send light from the top. So this is the uh, description of uh, the side view of the object on your microscope, on your cover slip, for instance. So this object is characterized by a reflective index, different from the environment. So if you send light, like a plane wave, these plane waves gets distorted. Just because, uh, for instance, in this case, light is traveling slower in the, this material here. So this is a new wavefront, the distorted wavefront by the objects lying on your uh, microscope. So we are interested in this wavefront profile, uh, which is also what we call the optical path difference, delta L, which is nothing but nothing but the okay, nothing but the thickness of your object times the mismatch of the of the indices. Uh, so the technique I'm going to present right now is capable of mapping the profile you see here, the optical path difference, the wavefront. And this wavefront is nothing but the phase. Sometimes we also call that a phase, that our technique is capable of mapping the phase of light, just because this wavefront of, or this optical path difference is directly proportional to the phase of light. So this is what we measure and how do we do that? Ah, uh, yes, sorry. So the object you, you had in mind, I don't know what, what, what it was, but in our case, we used many different things like a living cell. So this in this case, you have this kind of waveform distortion, but you can also have a waveform distortion if you heat, if you have a micro scale temperature gradient, if you have a nanoparticle, if you have like a 2D material, a meta surface or any roughness, on the surface. So in all these conditions, we can use our wavefront microscopy technique. And this is some examples of images we get when we use this technique. So these are real experimental images, although they look a bit 3D. Uh, these are real images of these six kinds of uh, samples we used. So during this talk, I will mostly focus on uh, the temperature metrology modality but I will also briefly speak about the other ones. So how do we do that? What's the principle of the technique? So we have a microscope, a very normal microscope, light from the top, your sample, and the bottom of the inverted microscope with a camera. So it looks like, and this, you have the, your object, your uh, phase object. So it looks like a very normal microscope. The only difference with a very normal microscope is the presence of a diffraction grating in front of the camera, like one millimeter from the sensor of the camera. This grating has to be very special. It has to be a two-dimensional grating with black lines defining transparent holes, square holes, uh, with a phase checkerboard uh, pattern, zero uh, and pi phase shifts. If you do that, you can map the wavefront of light and not only the intensity. Uh, I will explain why in a, in a minute. So either you do that, you place your wavefront, your uh, grating one millimeter from the camera, or if you don't have space to do it, because usually there is no space to do it, you may want to re-image your grating in front of your camera using a 4F relay lens system. That's also possible. 
And this is what actually we are doing now. We much more flexible to be able to move the grating to change the sensitivity. So this is an idea of what we are doing now. The grating, a relay lens, and a camera. This is a raw image we got with a camera, with this kind of camera, with when the object is a living cell. So usually I never show this uh, image, and uh, even less in papers because it's not very um, nice. But actually, so this is a raw image. This is not a post process for the moment. But if you zoom in, so let's zoom in on this image. Zoom in, zoom in. So I show this image because this is instructive. You see the raw image featuring many dots, bright dots. So each dot corresponds to one transparent pole of the grating. So this is, for instance, a raw image when we image a micro bead. So you see all these dots. Each dot is coming from these square holes. And from this image, using a post-processing algorithm, we can retrieve the intensity and the phase of the transmittance and the wavefront. So two images in one. So I won't enter into the details how we do it, how this algorithm is doing it, just to give you um, a flavor of, of how it's working. The transmittance image, the information of the transmittance image is contained within the intensity of the spots. And the information on the wavefront is contained within the positions of the spots. When the wavefront gets distorted on the camera, these dots you see here, they move, slightly move. Depend it's like a shadow effect, okay? And from this motion of these spots, we can reconstruct the wavefront gradients that we integrate to get the wavefront. So just to show you the kind of images we have in biology. Uh, so these are neurons uh, that are leading on a curve slip. And this is accelerated. The full movie is like 15 hours. So let's move on. Yeah. So here you see neurites moving that are normally invisible because much too thin using normal bright field microscopy. With wavefront microscopy, because we can see what is invisible, uh, we can beautifully see all the neurites, how they, you have mass transport along the neurites. If you look at them, you can see quantified mass transport. And at the end, they, yeah, they touch, they connect within the field of view. But I won't focus too much on what this technique can do in biology. It has been used a lot in biology. I will more focus on what we can do in uh, nanophotonics and thermoplasmonics. So let's focus first on how we have been using this technique, this wavefront microscopy technique for um, uh, 13 years now as a, as a temperature microscopy technique. So this is basically what we have done, uh, what I have done most of my uh, research time for uh, more than 10 years, heating uh, gold uh, nanoparticles using light. When you do that, uh, it's not complicated, actually. Anyone can do that. You just focus a laser on gold nanoparticles and it will be hot. Uh, the challenge is not really to heat. The challenge is more to measure the temperature. This is complicated because this is at the nanoscale, at the microscale. So uh, we are doing that using wavefront microscopy. When you heat, like, for instance, a single nanoparticle, like this one, and you send a plane wave, this plane wave is distorted by a um, thermal lens effect. The refractive index of the liquid decreases, so you have like a lens, and hence the distortion of the wavefront. So we can map this wavefront distortion, and this is the image you have here. With a normal camera, you would not see anything. If you hit like that with a normal camera, you don't see anything. With this wavefront camera, you see a beautiful, noise-free distortion of the wavefront. But this is not the temperature profile. This is still a wavefront distortion due to a three-dimensional temperature profile. But if you do some theory, you can easily show that you can retrieve still the temperature distribution from this wavefront distortion. This is a single nanoparticle, the wavefront distortion. And these two images are uh, retrieved from this reference distortion, the temperature map. And even, even more interestingly, the power per unit area. 
So this is very interesting because if you sum all these pixels of this image, you get a power. You know how much power is delivered in your sample and not on only what the temperature is. So this is something, this is a piece of information you cannot have with fluorescent molecules, for instance. And this is working for single nanoparticles, but also for arrays of nanoparticles or anything that is heating at the microscale. So we have been using since 2012, this technique quite a lot in chemistry, physics, biology. So this is a list of the papers we published. So I won't review all of them. I will focus only on a few, few, few of these uh, papers. I just want to highlight uh, for the moment some of them, like the, this one, superheating and bubble formation. So in this paper, for instance, we have explained why you can expect bubbles to form at very high temperature, much above 100 degrees uh, Celsius. And the reason why no one realized that before in the plasmonics community may be due to the fact that at that time, people were using fluorescent molecules to map temperature in plasmonics. But when you use a fluorescent molecule, you bleach it very easily at 60 degrees, 70 degrees. So the benefit of this technique, this wavefront microscopy, is that it's label free. We don't have to use anything, any molecule. And this is the reason why we could easily see water at 100 and 200 degrees without bleaching any, any, anything. So the benefit of this technique is that it's label free. Tomorrow, I can go to your lab with my camera. Uh, I can even take the uh, aircraft with this uh, camera. It passes uh, control. I go to your lab, to your microscope. I don't modify your sample, your microscope. I plug my camera in your microscope and I can map the temperature in your uh, sample. This is what I just did actually, or just maybe one year ago. I went to the group of uh, uh, Julian. Uh, I think he's in the participants uh, right now. So I went to Munich and uh, we could, so I, I plugged my camera, reference camera on his uh, Raman uh, thermometry setup. And we could compare, compare so this is this paper here, uh, my wavefront microscopy with his Raman uh, thermometry technique. We could compare the two of them. So it, it ended up with a paper. And uh, fortunately, we found the same temperature uh, in the sample. So I won't review all of these things. I will just focus on two papers uh, related to biology. So, and thermal uh, biology. So this is what we have done quite a lot, what we have done quite a lot this last uh, 10 years, heating an uniform array of gold nanoparticles. This is a side view of what we have done and the kind of temperature map we can uh, measure. And this is what we have done. We placed, we culture, we uh, cultured living cells on top of this array of nanoparticles and we heated them with a laser. And the aim was to study uh, thermal effects, was to study, I'm just reading, um, it's just to study uh, how a cell, living cell can fight against any temperature increase. So this is a kind of, with our microscope and this wavefront microscopy, this is what we can have at the same time. The shape of the cell using wavefront microscopy, as I, as I have shown with the neurons, the temperature distribution using the exact same wavefront microscopy, the exact same camera. So with one camera, we have two images. And in parallel, we could also measure fluorescence, like regular fluorescence. And we uh, label these cells so that we can see how they try to fight against uh, temperature increase. So what they fight against, when, when they are stressed, these cells, their nucleus, they feature uh, fluorescent, bright fluorescent granules. When the laser is off, they disappear. When the laser is on, they appear. And this is reversible. And this is accelerated. And here you can see uh, the monitoring of the intensity of the fluorescence of the granules. The two granules that you see in the nucleus their fluorescence one and two as a function of time and we have been heating only for one minute and at different uh, temperatures 39 42 and 44 
And you can see that the more you heat and the more it takes time for the cell to recover from this stress. So what was the aim of this study? The aim was to show the community uh, the benefit of using microscale heating using a laser. Biologists, they already do that. It was not new. They already know how to tag these cells this way. But when they did that, they were heating the whole stage of the microscope and even sometimes the whole microscope at 37, 39. When you do that, you have to wait for the stabilization of the temperature, which, which can take five minutes, 10 minutes, even more. So you cannot reach this time scale of a few uh, seconds. And as you see on these graphs, cells, when they are stressed this way, they can react in a few seconds. And you only realize it, you can only measure it if you can heat uh, very fast, if you can set the temperature very fast. And there is no secret, if you want the temperature to be set very fast, you have to heat at a micro scale. Otherwise, you prefer from uh, inertia. Hi, hi. Yes? Uh, Gail, do you have a question? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, just reading the question. So, so yes, I didn't speak about the spatial resolution of the, of, the, of the technique. So it is diffraction limited, meaning that you reach the diffraction limit uh, depending on the wavelength. So typically we have a diffraction resolution, uh, spatial resolution of 500 na nanometers. So yes, in our case, we heat, we, have the temp we set the temperature at the millisecond scale. So we have the time zero to investigate any temperature induced effect in uh, biology. So yeah, this was, this was the work of my previous PhD student, uh, Adrien Robert. Another application, a more recent application, in this application, we push a bit the button of the, the knob of the, of the laser to exceed 100 uh, degrees. And because there is uh, interest in doing that in biology, because I don't know if you know that, but the uh, highest temperature for life on the earth is around 120 degrees. So these are these um, microorganisms that are living at the bottom of the ocean, very close to these black smokers. Here, there are some bacteria that can live at very, at very high temperature. Uh, biologists, they know how to collect them. So they dive, they take them. Uh, they know how to image them using um, electronic microscopy, like in this image is here. However, as a problem with these kind of images the biologists have is that uh, they are dead. I mean, not the biologists, the, uh, the cells, they are dead because you are using uh, electronic microscopy. And uh, which is quite frustrating for a biologist supposed to uh, study life. So we thought maybe we could just did, just did what we did in the past, that we just have to turn the knob a bit more and we should be able to observe living hyper thermophilic microorganisms in a microscope without heating the microscope at such a high temperature because there is no commercial solution to heat a microscope at such a high temperature. So we tried, um, stated this way, it looks uh, simple, but it was a bit complicated. We have to fight against uh, convection and so on. So this was in collaboration with Patrick Forter, a biologist, a specialist in this uh, field of research. Um, and the benefit of our wavefront microscopy technique is that we could map the temperature, of course, but we could also image the bacteria, these thermophilic bacteria. This is the image of the wavefront distortion from the bacteria. And the strong benefit is that if you, if you sum all the pixels of this image, you get what is called uh, an optic, not the optical path difference, but the optical volume, which is here. And if you get yeah, here, the optical volume, and this quantity is directly proportional to the mass of the bacteria. This comes from the relation between uh, mass and um, the refractive index. So this technique, I didn't uh, say that uh, for the moment, but 
one of the benefits of this technique is its ability to measure masses of living cells. So we could couple these two uh, modalities, temperature microscopy and uh, mass measurements. This is a raw image of these bacteria. We were hitting with a laser over this area. You can see the isotherms from the 70 degrees where the, the uh, bacteria blossom. And you can see indeed that they are uh, dividing and growing where it is hot. So from, from this movie, we could uh, measure using this tri-mass measurement uh, technique, we could measure quantitatively how fast they were growing as a function of the temperature with only one movie. This is what is done here. So at the different isotherms, we could measure the mass of the bacteria as a function of time for different isotherms. In the log scale, you have lines which defines from which we can uh, measure the growth rate in mass per un uh, unit of time. And from one video, we could, we could reconstruct this very well-known uh, shape that is the growth rate, growth rate as a function of temperature. So the benefit we, uh, illust we illustrate, we wanted to illustrate with this uh, technique is how with only one single experiment, we could quantitatively measure the growth rate as a function of the, of the temperature. When biologists, they want to do that, they have to do one experiment in autoclaves per temperature, which takes a lot of time. He, we not only can do that in one experiment, but we can also see how they behave. For instance, if they stay, if they stick, if they swim, and so on. Yeah, so this, this is the work of male benefits and uh, Celine Molinaro. And for instance, we could see that indeed they swim. This kind of this uh, geobacillus, they can swim. So biologists, they knew it. I mean, they, they expected it because using EM, uh, they could see flagella. But for the first time, they could see them moving, swimming. Uh, they are swimming very fast, actually. And you can even swim, see some of them swimming that are extremely long, like 10 micron long, like this big one. So this was new. So it's just to show what you can learn more when you uh, use wavefront microscopy for the study of uh, thermophilic microorganisms. And we could also study what is called the germination. These bacteria, they, when they are stressed, they sporulate, they form spores. And uh, these spores, they are very stable. But as soon as the conditions are back to normal, they, uh, they germinate. So from these spores, for instance, this one, you see it, it creates a bacteria again, a valid bacteria. It's a, in a stochastic manner, so not all of them at the same time. So first this one, and then you can see a second one, like here, and so on. So we could quantify how fast they were growing as a function of the temperature and so on. So now I will uh, leave biology and uh, focus on uh, the applications in the nanophotonics. So you remember what I have said, you can use this technique to image temperature uh, profiles, but nanoparticles themselves also distort any incoming wavefront, any flat wavefront. So the image is like a, an airy uh, disk, airy pattern. So the images are great. You get the intensity and the phase of light. So you get basically the electromagnetic, the full electromagnetic field. But the interest is not only to show beautiful images. The interest is the following. If you consider these two images, and if you multiply these two images pixel-wise, and more precisely, if you multiply the square root of the first image of the intensity image by the, the complex exponential of the phase image, and if you sum all the pixels of the resulting uh, complex image, you get a complex number. And this complex number is nothing but the complex optical pol polarizability of the particle. So this is great. Once you know that, you know basically all the optical properties of your particle. The, uh, and in particular, the tree, tree, the tree uh, cross sections, extension, uh, scattering, and absorption. In principle, when you want to measure these three uh, features, you need three setups. Here is one setup 
and I would even say with one image, you can measure fully characterize these three uh, uh, cross sections. And these are the measurements as a function of the wavelengths. The measurements are the, the, the circles, and the theory are the solid lines. So we basically had a look to anything we had in the drawers of the Fresnel Institute. So we had nanoparticles, but we also had uh, 2D uh, materials like graphene. And in this case, on this image on the right, it was a molybdenum disulfide, which is a three atom thick uh, 2D material. And this is the kind of images we, we have with this kind of material. And in this case, you can also do some uh, quantitative metrology by multiplying these two images. But the expression is a bit different. Here you have the inverse of the square root. And at the end, you don't have any integration, meaning that this quantity sigma is not a number, it's an image. And this is the image of the complex optical conductivity of the material which can be converted into the complex uh, refractive index. So you have a map, a map of the refractive index of the material. So we measured graphene, MOS2, and this is where we are, where, where we are compared with the literature in terms of um, real and imaginary parts of the refractive index, and also for MOS2, and also as a function of the wavelengths. And the last uh, object we investigating uh, we investigated in um, nanopho for nanophotonics applications was uh, meta surfaces. So this is the kind of meta surface that uh, we investigated. So meta surfaces like this meta lens are aimed to distort the wavefront. So using wavefront microscopy to characterize meta lenses, it's the most natural uh, characterization characterization technique you can uh, think of. And this is theory compared to experiments. So it, the, the agreement is very, very good. So this was the work. So everything I presented related to nanophotonics, so nanoparticles to the materials and these metasurfaces was the work of Samir Akadir, a previous project of mine. And also what uh, we did here for these metasurfaces and the nanoparticle uh, paper was also in collaboration with uh, Michael Scholl, so the previous uh, speaker of this uh, session. So this is the end of my presentation. So just to summarize, everything we have um, we have investigated means nanophotonics and biology. And just a few words regarding this technique, which is a bit mysterious for many people. It looks very powerful, but not well known. Uh, so it has been invented like 20 years ago, but it has been introduced in microscopy more recently. And now it's more and more used. So not for many people for the moment. We are mainly French people using it, as you can see on the statistics here. But I am expecting um, a more balanced um, uh, dispersion of the technique in the next years in the whole planet. Uh, because there are many, many things to do in biology, nanophotonics, and anything at the micro scale. And uh, since maybe three to four years ago, I started to try and um, unmystify, popularize this, te this technique in the community by publishing papers to explain how to process the image, uh, how to deal with the noise. And also, at, I tend to put all my codes on my GitHub account. And also, I recently published this uh, review papers explaining what the applica applications are in both nanophotonics and uh, biology. Uh, so these are all the, all the people who have been in, um, uh, working on wavefront microscopy at the Fresnel Institute, and also all the collaboration we had regarding everything, uh, all what I presented today. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Guillaume, for the very nice talk with the nice results. And Germany was not on the map, apparently, <laughs> yet. Um, so are there any questions? There's already one question in the chat. Um, from Fuyan, you you want to ask yourself or should I read it? I can also quickly read it. Um, so regarding the polarizability measurements, is there any size limit for the particles uh, is the first question. And then it continues, which are the smallest that can be measured if the particles were asymmetric 
would it be possible to measure the different components of the polarizability? Yes. So the, so I said we are diffraction limited. It doesn't mean that we need objects bigger than the wavelengths. For instance, the nanoparticles you see on this image here are gold nanoparticles, which are 100 nanometer big. So they are much smaller than the wavelengths and the, the diffraction limit. This is why we see this airy, pat airy pattern. But what we can do in terms of uh, uh, optical polarizability measurements, what I presented here, is not limited by that. The nanoparticle can be as small as possible. This is still true. So yeah, so we can still do quantitative metrology, no matter the size of the size of the particle. However, if it is too small, then it will be below the noise we have on the image. Uh, so this is a, the limitation. At some point, they are too small to be visible, but it is not a real limitation because if it is the case, we just have to average many, many images. And at some point, we can fight against, I mean, we can decrease this, we can improve the signal to noise ratio until we can see nanoparticles. So, so far, we have been able to see uh, 80 nanometer big nanoparticles. And regarding the asymmetry, yes, so if, if they are asymmetric, so there is a technique that consists in sending uh, linear polarization and rotating this linear polarization and acquiring a series of um, images with different polarizations. If you do that, you can fully characterize your uh, particle uh, polarization-wise. There's another question by Dipta Prata. I, uh, I read that as well. For the heating of cells, would the method uh, be still possible if the heating agents are inside the cell, or would the method work in a strongly scattering complex medium? So yes, it would work as well. Equally, uh, it would be exactly the same. The only problem we have when we do that is that when we scan our laser, for instance, if by chance we hit like an agglomeration of particles, we burn everything. So we are not, we do not work with internalization of particles because of this reason. We prefer to work with a corporate uniform distribution of nanoparticles and the cells on top. This way we can put our laser anywhere we want. No surprise. We always have the same temperature increase, but nothing prevent from putting your laser within, I mean, putting the nanoparticles within the cells. Yeah. Well, maybe while the others prepare for questions, I, I have also a question. I mean, uh, there was a lot said about uh, uh, resolution, and uh, I was wondering uh, also the in terms of the phase delay, this minimum phase delay you can detect, uh, this will depend uh, solely on the signal-to-noise ratio or the average you do. Yeah. What is the smallest phase delay uh, if you want to look, for example, at the uh, distribution of chemical components also changing the, um, the refractive index of the mixture. So the minimum, uh, the typical um, wavefront distortion we can measure in nanometers, it's below mm -hmm. one nanometer. It's typically 0 0.3 for like one second exposure time. But so it depends on the exposure time and the number of images you manage to average per uh, second or per mm -hmm. unit of time. So there is no limit. There is no limit. If you, for instance, use a very high speed camera and a huge laser intense, a huge light intensity, you can image maybe 1000 images per second. And in this case, you can, you have a huge, I mean, uh, a fantastic uh, signal to noise ratio. So typically it's 0 0.3, we can go down to 0 0.1, even less. Um, and if you think about it, this length, it's the size of a hydrogen atom. So this technique is really, really, sensitive in, te in, in terms of uh, wavefront distortion. We can measure a single uh, layer of carbon atom, graphene. So it's very good. We uh, already tried to image chemicals, uh, but uh, the, yeah, since we have to uh, fight against the signal to noise ratio and accumulate many images, since we are moving and uh, we do not have this, the time resolution, so we, we didn't push towards this direction, but it could be possible to image a concentration gradients within fluids, yeah. Okay, I, I will contact you again uh, because of this issue, I think. Yeah. So there's a new question prepared from uh, Pavel. Uh, in temperature measurements, can you discriminate between heating and cooling? 
So if we, so, let's say we can manage to to pull down locally. Uh, it would just lead to an inverted contrast, and our algorithm would would work equally. It, it would give a negative temperature. Yes, sure, it would work. However, I don't know how it would cool down. If you cool down using a Peltier cell, for instance, or anything else, you will cool down your whole sample, and we don't see anything. So I think Pablo has an idea about that. <laughs> ah, okay. So if you, if there is an idea, uh, it will be perfect. But just something important: we are only sensitive to gradients, yeah. wavefront gradients. So if you uniformly heat your sample, we don't see anything. Yeah. We just see a temperature increase, not the absolute uh, temperature. But it, yes, if you manage to, to cool down, it will work. Also, yeah. this could be local cooling, of course. Yeah. yeah. 